So we established in our last class that the DNA does play a role, but what we do, how we live, probably has more to do with our DNA than anything else. So being mindful of that, of course, helps us to be mindful of our DNA and helps us to, and as we'll go through this, you'll find out all the basic conditions. It helps us to, to give our body the right conditions so that it can heal because we live in a self-regulating, self-healing, self-balancing body. And if it's not working well, then we have to put the detective hat on and find out why. Why isn't it working well? And adjusting, adjusting what we're doing and listening or observing the results. So we're going to look at the second theory on why people get sick. And the second theory on why people get sick is the germ theory. And Louis Pasteur first presented the germ theory, I think it was about the mid-1800s. And that's about the time that Florence Nightingale started to come onto the scene. And Florence Nightingale was asked to go to Scutari. Scutari is the port where, the, where the, there was a hospital there and the wounded from the Crimean War were being taken. So let me draw this for you. Here's Scutari. So the Russians are fighting the British and the French. And here is the Black Sea. They're not as perfectly oval as I have drawn it. And Crimea. Actually, Crimea is where the battle was taking place. This is the battle. Crimea is where the battle is being taken taking place, the British and the French are fighting the Russians, the wounded are put in boats and they're sailed to Scutari and Scutari is where the hospital was, it was an ex-army Turkish barracks. And when Florence Nightingale, she had an amazing effect in there as we will see, but when she read of Louis Pasteur's theory that germs cause disease, she said, this is the theory of a man of a very unstable mind. <laughs> and she said, and anyone who believes it is equally unstable. Because she knew that germs don't cause disease, they're the result. So let's have a look at germs. What are germs? Germs are microorganisms. Microorganisms are everywhere. They're in the air we breathe. They're on every surface area, they're in our bodies, and they're microscopic, so you can't see them with the naked eye. They're organisms, so they are the living things. They're everywhere. There are 10 times more microorganisms in our body than cells, and we've got 100 trillion cells. And there are 10 times more microorganisms in our gastrointestinal tract than anywhere else in the body. But whenever cell damage happens, these microorganisms change roles. And this is basically where the misconception comes in. They change roles. One microbiologist that attended our program several times, he said, we call them the garbage collectors. Or they could be called the cleanup team. They're the garbage collectors. And the garbage collectors know exactly what they've got to do. See, do you call yours garbage collectors? I know you call trash can, is that right? We call it garbage bin. But the, the trucks that come to pick up the garbage, they're called garbage collectors? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Now, garbage collectors, they never take your, your front fence, do they? They never take your car, do they? <laughs> Because their, their job is only to do one thing, is that's collect the garbage. That's what these guys do. That's their role. And their name is bacteria. So whenever there is cell damage, our microorganisms have the ability to change roles. They change roles and now become the cleanup team. We change roles all through our life. I'm not dressed now the way I was dressed 
when I was sleeping last night, my daughter's given me this most beautiful linen nightie. <laughs> It's very nice to sleep in. My friends say that I look, I look like I'm out of house on the prairie. <laughs> I'm not dressed now the way I was dressed when I was sleeping last night. I'm not dressed now the way I'm dressed on my morning exercise. I'm not dressed now the way I'm dressed when I'm swimming. I'm not dressed now the way I'm dressed when I'm digging in my garden. We change roles according to the environment. I'm not dressed now the way I'm sure I'll be dressed in Ireland next week. I'll have my woolly jumper on. <laughs> we change roles according to the environment. The environment dictates our dress. And I hear you've had some hot weather here <laughs> in Dallas, yeah? That's a bit cooler today, is that right? Oh, yes. So everyone's got their woolly jumpers on nearly today. <laughs> So the, these microorganisms, they change roles according to the environment. As the environment change, remember there's been cell damage, the garbage collectors come along. As they work on what's happening, the, the microorganisms change. They now become the exterminators. What's the exterminator's name? I'm sure you've heard of them. They're the yeast, they're the fungus. And there's another name that I'm sure you've all, if you haven't heard of it before, you heard of it in 2020, 2021, it's called virus. And if you have a look at the functions of a virus, how they work, how they need a host, they're exactly the same as the yeast and fungus. Interesting. As the environment changes, so do they. They now become the undertakers. So what do undertakers do? They take away dead things. The name of the undertakers is mold. And it's not long after the mold stage that the matter is brought back to dust. You have a good effect on this. I want to use another color. Matter back to dust. What does the preacher say in the funeral? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. He's referring to what's going to take place in that coffin. It's going to be brought back to dust. What I have just drawn for you here. Oops. Sorry about that. What I've drawn for you here is the cycle of life. Or it's sometimes called the carbon cycle. And a basic law of science states nothing's created, nothing's destroyed. It just changes form. It's the carbon cycle. And this is why we have compost bins, because in the compost bin, these microorganisms that were active in the apple tree causing a flower to develop. And then an apple develops. And all of this action happens under the same microorganisms. They just change roles according to the environment. And then the apple's not ready to eat. I, ordered, I, I ate an apple crisp this morning. Oh, very, very nice apple. But when that apple's fully developed, it's not ready to eat. Mine was ready to eat because it was sweet. What causes that apple that's just developed, it is now bitter, you wouldn't want to eat it, the same microorganisms that cause the development now cause the ripening. No one eats the apple, so what happens to the apple? It rots under the action of the same microorganisms. They change roles according to the environment. Let me give you another illustration. Mother hen is sitting on 10 eggs. I come along, pick up an egg, and I shake it violently. I put it back under mother hen. I come back two weeks later, I hear chirp, chirp. I see the chickens coming out of the eggs. Where's the egg? I shook. What's mother hen done with it? Have you seen what she does? She boots it out of the nest because there's a bad smell coming out of it. What did I do? I caused massive cell damage when I shook it. And the microorganisms that would have contributed to the building up of little chicken 
now had to change roles. They now had to become the clean-up team, the garbage collectors. They had to take their suit of clothes off, so to speak, and put their rubber gloves and apron on and become the clean-up team, the garbage collectors. As the environment changed, the exterminators. As the environment changed, the undertakers, until eventually matter has been brought back to dust. It's the cycle of life, the carbon cycle. A basic law of science states nothing's created, nothing's destroyed. It just changes form. Antoine Bouchon. Antoine Bouchon should be famous, but he's not. He was a six times professor, contemporary at the time of Louis Pasteur, but he believed differently to Pasteur. He said, Germs aren't the cause of disease, they're the result. He said disease is born in us and of us. Well, no one liked that. Everyone liked Pasteur. Pasteur said, a germ has jumped on you, made you sick, take this drug to kill that germ and you will be well. Can you see the difference? Mm. Pasteur didn't say, what time are you going to bed at night? How much water are you drinking? What are you eating at the moment? Hey? Oh, no, 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 no. People would much rather blame the gene or the germ than what's happening in their body. Have you noticed the CDC figures? That 99% of people that get COVID recover. So is there something to fear? Have you noticed that the people that went down had pre-existing health conditions? It was just the straw that broke the camel's back. Have you noticed? It's not the germ. It's not the virus. But wasn't it crazy what people did? People wouldn't touch each other? Yeah. A friend of mine, we're on the different pages. She's actually a relative. She wrote me a letter. She said, we're not accepting any non-vaccinated people in our home anymore. I wrote back to her and said, I'll miss you. <laughs> You're always welcome in my home. Have you noticed in the stories of Jesus, he always touched. He always touched. He even touched the lepers. And Dr. Matthew Walker, you might have heard of Dr. Matthew Walker, the juicy man, I think he's passed now. If he was alive, he'd probably be 120 now. He went and lived in the leper colony to show that when your body is strong and working well, you have nothing to fear from anything outside. What's the old saying? We've more to fear from within than without. That's why I never stop touching people. And if I was asked to go into a shop and sanitise my hand, I'd pretend. Just walk into the shops. <laughs> because I don't put chemicals on in my body. Mm. People say, what do you disinfect at your health centre? I said, nothing. We keep it clean. See, we've got to get away from this kill mentality. Antoine Bouchon got a dead cat <coughs> one day. He got a dead cat. He put it in an airtight container. Four months later, he opened the container. Dust. What brought cat back to dust? Let me give you an Australian illustration. If a cat dies in the bush in Australia, well, the kookaburra and the crow have a nibble, the dingo might have a nibble, the, the blowfly lays the maggots and they clean it up and the worms and the dung beetles come up from the earth. They're all the scavengers, isn't that true? And in the plains of Africa, there's the hyenas, there's the vultures, there's scavengers. But when he put the dead cat into the uh, airtight container, no scavengers helped the process. So why was cat brought back to dust? The microorganisms that were in that cat, ultimate cell damage is death. When the cat died, they took off their, rub, their, their suit of clothes, so to speak, put their rubber gloves and apron on and worked at bringing cat back to dust. With great excitement, Antoine Bouchon 
got the dust, put it under the microscope. It was alive with microorganisms. Basic law of science states nothing's created, nothing's destroyed. It just changes form. Isn't that why we have compost bins? We have compost bins to bring matter back to dust. I have three compost bins in our garden, our, vet, our misty mountain garden. It's about a metre, you'd say yard, yard by yard by yard square, each compost bin. One, we're adding two, we're adding scraps out of the garden, we get, we're adding weeds out of the, sorry, scraps from the kitchen, weeds from the garden, and the corn stalks or the broccoli stalks, you know, crisscross them so you've got a bit of air in there. And if you go there in the morning, there's a lot of birds there, all having a little peck. The next compost bin is sitting. As it's sitting, what's happening? Matter is being brought back to dust. And the third compost bin, I know it's ready to go in the garden because tomato plants and pumpkin plants start shooting out of the compost. Mm -hmm. And I dig into it and there's worms everywhere. I pick up a lump and smell it. Beautiful earth. In fact, one compost man who's written a book on the subject, he said, we always get women to smell our compost because they've got a very keen sense of smell. <laughs> I, those compost bring, bins are bringing matter back to dust. And before I put another crop in my garden beds, if I have one crop in and I harvest it, I do not put another one in till I feed the soil. That's common sense, isn't it? Because the last crop, took out nutrients, minerals, and I need to put more back in. So let me show you what's happening with the compost bins, with those microorganisms. Underneath the soil is roots, the root system. And when I put compost into my soil, I'm putting in microorganisms. I can't see them, but I know they're there. You see, they were in the carrot. They were in the whatever I put into my compost. And now, after they've brought the matter back to dust, they're going to play another role. Now, they are responsible for the breakdown of the minerals in the soil. Aren't you glad we don't have to eat dirt to get our minerals? And you couldn't get it anyway. I'm sure we've all seen our babies eat dirt. What happens in the diaper the next day? Dirt <laughs> just goes straight through. <laughs> they can't access the minerals. But these microorganisms in the soil break down those minerals. They are respons responsible for the absorption of those minerals into the roots of the plant. They protect the plant against any harmful pathogens. They nourish the plant. This plant knows that it needs those microorganisms. So 50% of the fuel that it makes from photosynthesis, it sends back down to the roots to feed the microbes. It's a beautiful illustration that the law of service is written on every plant in nature. Every plant in nature takes with one purpose and one purpose alone and that is to give. It's actually the law of life. The Bible said it's more blessed to give than receive. It's the law of life. In fact, the more you give, the more you can receive. Lining our gastrointestinal tract are villi. And these villi look very much like the roots of the plant. And these villi when we were in our mother's utero, our gut was sterile. But when we were born, we were literally showered with our mother's microorganisms and it causes a thick turf wall to be built up, lining over the villi. And those microorganisms in our back, you've heard of them? Thanks. Is that better? Yes. <laughs> So the microorganisms that are in our gut 
They've got flora, Lactobacillus acidophilus, bifidus bacterium. We've heard of all those, those guys. They're called our healthy or our um, friendly flora or bacteria. They play the same role. They are responsible for the final breakdown of our food. They are responsible for the absorption of the food out of our gut and into the blood. And they are also protect our blood against any harmful pathogens that may be in the gut. They nourish the cells that line the gastrointestinal tract. Are you starting to see that these microbes are not our enemies? These microorganisms are an integral and important part of life, not only on planet Earth, but absolutely in the body. And this correct balance, this correct balance of gut flora is essential for the building up of our immune system. Not many people link our immune system to our gut flora. In our large intestine, our colon, there are little lobes called payas patches. And it's in those payas patches where our lymphatic, which our lymphatic cells, which are called lymphocytes, part of our immune system, they are also fed by the healthy, friendly flora. Now there's one thing that everyone agreed on in 2021, one thing, and that was that the best protection was a strong immune system. Is that right? And yet where is our immune system sourced? <laughs> In our gut flora. So there's a lot of talk about our, they call it our microbiome. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Gut flora. Mm -hmm. Are you starting to see they're not our enemy? In fact, these are the players in the cycle of life. These are the performers in the cycle of life. And Florence Nightingale knew this. And so did Ant uh, Antoine Beauchamp, of course. Six times professor, and yet hardly anyone's heard of him because no one liked his theory. In fact, when he died, it was six fool's cap pages of accomplishments in his lifetime, and yet most people have never heard of him. Louis Pasteur was a chemist. He was a socialite. He called the media to every experiment he did. That's a bit of a worry, isn't it? When the media rings me and wants to talk to me, I say, no, thank you. <laughs> I know, and they have in times past. Twisted. Ooh, what they do? In fact, we always said the most unethical profession was a lawyer. Now we say it's journalism. Mm -hmm. And you can get a journalist who is ethical, but when it comes time to print, it rests with the editor. Let me give you Florence Nightingale's story. Florence Nightingale um, was born to very wealthy parents. And Florence Nightingale, she was not happy with painting a uh, a um, fine picture and sewing a fine seam, which all young ladies in her day did. Florence Nightingale was a studier and her father taught her, he educated her, which was very unusual in the day. And she just wanted to help people. At the age of 18, she said, God spoke to her and she wanted to work for God. But it didn't actually reveal how she could do this till about the age of 30. In fact, at the age of 30, she said, OK, away with marriage, away with parties. I now want to only work for people. She said the only time she was truly happy was when she was in the village giving food parcels out to the poor people. And yet her mother and her sister, they loved the social life, the parties. And about that time, it was 1854, a journalist, a war correspondent, he went to Scutari to report on the war effort and he was shocked at what he found. The death rate in that hospital was 50%. These are young, strong men. In fact, they had a better, a better, a better success rate on the battlefront than they had in that hospital. In the hospital, there was raw sewage in the corridors. It was just horrific. And so he went back and he, he, the headlines in the newspaper said, did we raise our young men to end up like this? 
Well, the British people rose up. They were their sons. They were their nephews. They were their grandsons. And so Florence and 35 nurses were asked to go to Scutari to see what they could do. The doctors would not let her in. They said, this is men's business. Women don't come in here. So she went to the kitchen. And in the kitchen, there were big vats of water with bits of rotten meat in it. That was their food. She knew her limitations of a woman, as a woman, so she asked the British government to start a sanitary commission. The sanitary commission came and assessed what was happening. And they found that the hospital was built in a swamp and there was a dead horse in the swamp and there was a dead dog in the swamp and the men in that hospital, it was many stories high, they were drinking the water out of that swamp. In fact, what an incredible body we live in. I'm surprised that the death rate wasn't 80%. So what Florence did was she, well, what these men did, the first thing they did was they got rid of the dead, dead dog, dead horse, boiled the water, drain, got the drainage happening, got the sewage happening fixed. So they, they certainly went to work on all of that, especially when the report came out that the French soldiers were better looked after than the British. That really got things moving. It's often political. And another shipload of wounded arrived. 1,200 wounded men arrived and the hospital was already overflowing. So the doctor said to Florence and her nurses, all right, you can come in. And the first thing they did was they started scrubbing. Florence insisted that the doctors wash their hands between operations, which they were not. Do you know, it's just square one today, but do you know it was laughed at back in the mid 1800s? So, the, so in, the, in 1850, all the sewage from London went into the Thames in London and the people living in London drank that water. No wonder the Black Plague happened. No wonder people aren't dying of infectious diseases anymore. No, it wasn't the childhood shots that stopped all that childhood illness. It was Florence Nightingale. So once all these big changes happened in the hospital, and once Florence was allowed in, she just started scrubbing and cleaning and scrubbing and cleaning. And in two months, the death rate went from 50% to 2%. Wow. Mm. That's why we can't forget Florence. Mm -hmm. you don't hear much about Florence Nightingale, do you? That's because there are certain powers that be want you to think it was medicine and it wasn't like that. <laughs> How did Florence know this and the doctors didn't? She read her Bible. And if you read in the Bible about the, hell, the, the cleanliness rules that God gave Moses, you see, millions of people are in the desert, 40 years they were in the desert, you know there was no sickness in that camp. The camp was in perfect order. If someone wanted to go to the bathroom, they had to go outside the camp, dig a hole, and no one was to know that he'd been there or she'd been there. Someone died in the camp, and the only people that died in the camp were people that died of old age. And yet what's happening in most refugee camps today? A lot of disease there, isn't there? And it's because of lack of hygiene, sanitation, and nutrition. If someone died in the camp, the people that took the person out of the camp, they could not go back into the camp for three days. They had to wash their hands, they had to wa wash their whole bodies, they had to wash their clothes before they could go back into the camp. Because when someone dies, what's active? All of this. <laughs> All of this. And so Florence, after 14 months, incredible reforms, went back to London. They hailed her as a heroine. And when she saw the welcoming party, uh, Prince Albert, Queen Victoria were there, she changed her name to Mary Smith, went down the back gangplank and went home. They said to her, why did you do that later? She said, I'm not a heroine. All I did was increase hygiene. That's personal hygiene. Wash the body every day. Wash your clothes, <laughs> because our body's continually throwing off waste, as you'll see in my next lecture when we look at the liver and detox. She, so wash your body every day, wash the clothes every day. Uh, sanitation, keep the house clean, sweep the floor, empty the, 
he caught the trash can, scrubbed the shower every week. And, high, and the third one is nutrition. Your body cannot heal unless you give it the right building materials. It needs vegetables, it needs fruits, it needs proteins, as in your legumes, some of your whole grains. It needs good fats, that's your nuts, your seeds, your avocados, your coconut, your little olive oil, coconut oil. It's really just common sense, isn't it? It's like our sons, they come to help us build a new extension and they're very good builders, they do a good job. But they can't build the extension unless we give them the timber to build with. We live in a body that has an incredible ability to heal itself, but if you don't supply the building materials, it's, it's limited as to what it can do. That's why we need to remember Florence Nightingale. Did you know that childhood illnesses were on the decrease by 80 to 90 percent, sometimes 100 percent, before the vaccines were introduced. Now, we are not told that, and it used to be in the medical journals, but they've uh, <clears throat> conveniently taken that out. I do have a few books where the original graphs are still shown, and what caused the drop was increase in hygiene, sanitation and nutrition. Children are not dying from infectious diseases today. Have you seen photos from that time? Where children, they wouldn't wash for six months. They were sitting in the, in the gutter playing in the, in the filth amongst the rats. Yeah, no wonder there was so much disease. That's why we need to remember our history. Because they put an extensive sewage system under London by the late 1850s, I think it was, then, then, then the water became clear. But there's always a reason why. There's always a reason. Florence Nightingale made similar reforms in a lot of Indian hospitals. So when I was in a hospital in the Solomon Islands a few years ago, I was being interviewed and one of the interviewers said, do you mind going and visiting my wife? She's in hospital. When I went in, a cat jumped out the window. And when I went into her room, this lady is lying in fluid from the, the hole in her abdomen, bowel fluid, and there was half a bandage on that was, stake, was sticky taped onto her skin with sticky tape. I have to tell you, I was not very happy when I saw that. And she said that they were supposed to wash it, but they hadn't washed it a day. Yeah. So I decided to go and look for some nurses. And I saw three nurses in the nurses' station just sitting and chatting and laughing. And I said, excuse me, I'm just visiting this lady. Um, she hasn't been washed today. Is there any reason why she hasn't been washed? And they looked at me and I said, she needs to be washed immediately. She needs to have a tree, a clean dressing on her, or I don't like to know what's going to happen. They nodded, they jumped up, they run down and took all this stuff down to her room. And as I walked past, and I said, and I'm coming back tomorrow. And they said, who are you? <laughs> I said, I'm an Australian health doctor and I'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> I'm a doctor that teaches true medicine, the body's ability to heal itself. When I came back the next day, they said, what did you do? They said she had clean dressing, everything had been changed. I thought, wow, well, they need Florence Nightingale in that hospital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the last I heard, she was being moved to, to New Zealand, to, <laughs> to another hospital. They'd, it's just basic common sense, really, isn't it? Keep, keep the house clean. That's all Florence Nightingale did. No wonder she said that, that the theory that germs cause disease is a theory of a very unstable mind. And anyone who e believes it is equally unstable because germs don't cause disease. Got that? They're the result of unhealthful conditions. If they're active, we need to know wrong. We need to know why. I'd like to address one of the main 
medications that use today to uh, to kill to kill any bacteria that someone may have. It's an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to address this drug. And I'd like to look at the at the explanation of that word. It's against life. Now, anything that has the ability to kill a small organism has the potential to kill a large. And what are we? We're the large. Is that right? What is an antibiotic? Alexander Fleming, 1929. He's in his laboratory and he's growing bacteria in flasks. He comes in one morning and all the bacteria is dead. And he knew Newton's third law of motion to every action. There's an equal and an opposite reaction. Why was his bacteria dead? So he began to look around the laboratory. Nothing there could have done it. But there was an open window and the sun was coming in and there was a dust on the sun's rays. And the dust was settling onto his bacteria. As he searched further, in the next story, there was an open window, a plate of fruit. In the plate of fruit, there was a mouldy orange. Do you remember the story from the school days? That mould dust was coming down, settling on the bacteria and killing it. So he called the mould penicillium. But the mould waste that's coming off the mould is more toxic even than the mould. So the mould waste, and by the way, the mould waste medicine calls mycotoxin. What's a toxin? poison. So he called the mould waste penicillic acid and the penicillic acid is the penicillin that we know today. And granted penicillin has saved the lives of probably millions and will continue but we've got a problem today and the problem is the overuse of the antibiotic. The human body can cope with one or two courses in a lifetime. Did everyone hear that one? Too. Just want to make sure everyone heard. I'm not against antibiotics. I'm against the overuse. So I raised eight children with no antibiotics. Actually, my first child had four courses over six weeks for an earache, and the earache kept coming back, and I was so frustrated. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what else to do. But that experience catapulted me into natural medicine. Because what's the definition of insanity? Mm -hmm. <laughs> to do what you've always done and expect different results. And when I said to the doctor when he's writing the fifth course, why did I keep going back? Because the earache kept coming back. And everyone said, don't play with this, she'll go deaf. I don't want my daughter to go deaf. Why did I go to them? Fear. I didn't know what else to do. That's why I always answer a mother, because I know what it's like not knowing what else to do, but knowing that this is not fixing her. So when I said to him, when I said to that doctor, will my daughter be on antibiotics for the rest of her life? He was very challenged by my question. I'm coming to that conclusion. He referred me to an ear, nose and throat specialist who looked in Emma's ears, in her mouth, and said, the child's teething. Give her these drops to keep the eustachian tubes clear. No more earache. So two years later, when my next child gets an earache, I don't go to the doctor and I don't tell anyone. I go to the old lady next door. She's 85, I'm 25. What did your mother do when you were a little girl and got an earache? She said, Mum would steam up an onion on the stove. I put it on my son's ear. He slept for two hours and he didn't ever get another earache. Yes, he's 45 today. No wonder I became interested in alternatives. So I'm thankful for antibiotics because that disastrous experience, it woke me up. There's got to be something else. And so when I say I never gave any of my children, looks like I've lost my voice, yeah. any of my children an antibiotic except for that experience. And they've had colds and they've had diarrhea and they've had bronchitis and they've had asthma, they've had all the things that children have. 
and I didn't give them any antibiotics. And I've got some good news, they're all still alive. <laughs> and when their children get sick, they don't give them antibiotics. If they're not sure what to do, they'll ring mum. But they grew up in a home where we did poultices, where we used garlic, where we used lemon, where we used all those sorts of things. And we got Ruthie, better. Harry. We got better. Because the body can heal itself when you give it the right conditions. I read in the newspaper of, a, of an experiment, they had 100 people had the flu, 50 took antibiotics, 50 didn't, all got better. Did you hear that? <laughs> all got better. So often we get better despite what natural healing requires is faith. And just talk as loud as I possibly can. So let me show you, let me show you the two systems, the two systems today, one's based on faith and the Bible says that if you can see it, it's not faith, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, if you can see it, it's not faith. I'm sure at the moment, everyone living in Dallas has faith that the rain will come, is that right? <laughs> I've just heard that you've just gone 30 days of searing heats, and I look at that pond out there and it's dropping fast, isn't it? But I think you have faith, yeah? So you can't see it. And faith in a human body that was created by the God of heaven to heal. It was created to heal. Even people that don't have a faith in God know that if they cut themselves, it'll heal. It'll heal. And sometimes we can apply herbs which will help. They work with the body. This is the truth. But there's another system and this system is based on fear. It's based on a system that it, the theory is that we evolved, we evolved. I like what the Bible says, that I was created in the image of God. What an honour. I didn't just evolve out of slime. There's a big difference. So this theory is that we evolved. In fact, looking at science, it makes no sense at all. And when my sister, who studied science in the university, then she was knocked over by a car, drunk driver. It was a miracle that she is alive. And I praise God for medicine. She wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for medicine. Medicine has a place in a crisis. Absolutely. But I don't believe in day-to-day -day illnesses, little hiccups that happen in our body. Yes, in a crisis. But she woke up in that crisis and she started to have faith in God. And she used to ring me and she'd say, I'm now going to have a look at science from Christianity because she said, I've been trained in science from evolution. And she said, I've come to the conclusion you need more faith to believe in evolution <laughs> than creation. It doesn't make any sense. And because our body evolved, it cannot heal. And because it cannot heal, we have to give it a drug. But I have to tell you, there's so much deception about the drugs. Is that right? Yes. We were told that the crisis would, would be abated, that everyone would be well if they got the shot. Is that right, Walkman? What are we seeing now? It's causing yeah, more problems. It didn't prevent side effects. It didn't prevent, you know what? <laughs> we were all deceived. I know what system that I believe in, and that's the system that goes towards healing. That makes the most sense. 
But what's happening with antibiotics today and the World Health Organization, they have a plaque in every doctor's surgery in Australia, the World Health Organization biggest health scare is the overuse of the antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Because people are getting seriously ill and they're not working. And when you put a mold waste into your body, you've got a whole nother equation happening. How many people take antibiotics and get thrush? Yeah. There's a big link today between fungus and illness. And there is an Italian oncologist named Dr. Tullio Simoncini. He's written a book called Cancer is a Fungus. Well, they had to take him down, and they did. They've taken all of his qualifications away from him. And one of the criticisms of me is that I am quoting a uh, disgraced oncologist. He's not disgraced in my eyes. Apparently, he injected a patient with sodium bicarbonate, which he was having great <clears throat> success with, and the patient died. My husband said, if only he'd injected him with chemotherapy, mm -hmm. uh, yes. he would not have lost his qualification. <laughs> In fact, are you finding out that the ones that are taken down are usually the good ones? Mm -hmm. And so there's a big link between fungus and many illnesses today. Fungus can come into your body in many ways. It can come in through your skin. Don't ever touch anything that's mouldy or even slightly mouldy. Mm. It can come in through inhalation. It can come in through ingestion and it can come into the body by sexual transmission. If you have a look in a medical textbook or a medical dictionary, I should say, at the word myco, that means fungus, you will find page after page in the medical dictionary of myco, myco pneumonia, mycoarthritis, myco, myco, it's all got a fungal base. I was talking to a med student, I said, have you studied mycology? He said, no. And he's going to do his fifth year of medicine. Why don't they study the role of fungus and disease? Because their main drugs are putting it in. <laughs> and so, how can you get it out of the body? That's the million dollar question. How can you get it out of the body? Number one, starve. What's fungus's favourite food? Sugar. 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 We, have ordered, we have got several boxes of my books coming, hopefully today or tomorrow, the book's called self Heal by Design, and basically that book explores this in detail. It's very well referenced. I also quote Dr. Uh, Constantini, Professor, his former head of the World, World Health Organization, Department of Mycology. What's the study of, study of mycology? The study of fungus. And he shows the clear link between fungus and disease. One of his, one of his books, 30,000 research papers, showing that clear link between fungus and disease. But how do we get it out of the body? Starve it. What's his favourite food? Sugar, sugar and yeast. So the sugars and the yeast must stop. How would a person know if they had a fungal presence in their body? It's usually the tongue is white. If you can scrape off the white, it's um, usually waste. Mm -hmm. But if you can't scrape off the white at the back of your tongue, they're little fungus buds. Do you remember when doctors used to look at your tongue? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not much today, because not many people have a pink tongue. It should be pink from the tip to the back. Usually after this lecture, everyone's running to the bathroom and have a look at their tongue. So starve the fungus, that's, that's number one. Number two, kill. I do think we've got to get away from the kill mentality, but I've got some good news. There are herbs that will kill the fungus and will not kill you. You see, one writer said when someone takes an antibiotic, it's like they've just dropped an atomic bomb in the body, in the gut. What did the atomic bomb do? It killed the good and the bad alike. And that's what the, and I think most people are aware of that, it kills off all the good bacteria, well, a lot of it. So it'll kill harmful bacteria and good bacteria. But God made herbs 
And in Psalm 104, verse 14, the Bible says that God gave herbs for the service of man. I love that verse. It's like the herbs come in and say, where would you like me? What would you like me to do? What would you have me do? So the, the herbs come to serve you. So they're not going to kill any good guys. And I think most people are aware of garlic. Garlic's a very strong antibiotic, antifungal herb. How would you take it if you wanted to take it instead of an antibiotic? You would take probably three good-sized raw cloves of garlic a day. Now, not everyone can handle raw garlic, but if you crush it into a bowl of hot soup, it just takes the edge off. Or what some people do, they'll have a slice of sourdough, spelt toast, olive oil, crushed garlic, uh, avocado, tomato. Nice, very nice sandwich. <laughs> See, the avocado and the tomato and the, and the bread and the oil underneath, they, they, uh, they calm the, the heat of that garlic down. Or even uh, crushing it into mashed avocado, that's, that's also nice. So just finding out a way to get it in. Yeah? I've actually juiced it with lemons. I, I juice it with lemon. And, and juice it with lemon. Juice it with lemon. Oh, yeah, that'll be a hot one. <laughs> <laughs> so just finding out how to get it in and... Another one is olive leaf extract. Most people are familiar with olive leaf extract. That would be about a teaspoon three times a day to equal the antibacterial, antifungal. And of course, the beauty of these herbs is they're also antifungal and antibacterial, but only the, the pathogenic, the ones we don't want in the body. Grapefruit seed extract. So if you've ever eaten a grapefruit and bitten into a seed, you'll think the grapefruit's sweet once you bite that seed. Those strong, volatile oils in there are very strong antifungal. So it's something like five drops three times a day. And another one is oregano. I think you call it oregano. oregano. Is that right? Yeah. Um, now that's very strong. So how you would start with that, you might have one drop in a little water three times a day, next day two drops, third day three drops in a little bit of water three times a day and just keep it up to three drops. Maybe you would do that for, for a week. But because our body has this incredible ability to adapt and adjust, the microorganisms have the ability to adapt and adjust, if someone's looking at conquering a fungal problem in their body, I suggest they alternate it every week. So just when the body's starting to get used to garlic, go over to olive leaf extract. <laughs> just when the body's getting used to olive leaf extract, go over to grapefruit seed extract. So I've given you four, and the fifth one is uh, portiaco. Portiaco is a South American herb and has a plant chemical in it called lapacho, very strong antifungal properties in, in that. So there's your kill. Remember, we're looking at how to eliminate yeast or fungus from the body. Number one, you've got to turn the tap off. Number two, uh, kill, kill with the herbs. You said you had five, but I only heard four. Uh, garlic, okay. olive leaf extract, Grapefruit. Um, grapefruit seed extract, oregano, and portiaco. Thank you. Number three, and by the way, to take portiaco, you can usually get it in a tablet or a capsule form in uh, places like uh, Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, places like that. You have a section on, on herbal tablets and things. Can you smell that? Portiaco. Pool. And then a D, and then an Arco. <laughs> it's probably my accent, yeah? Like the oregano to oregano. It's poor Dianco, yeah? Can I repeat the olive leaf? So the olive leaf dosage is usually in a liquid form, and it's usually one teaspoon three times a day. Thank you. Yeah? Garlic, when it's fermented, does that still work? Yeah, garlic, when it's fermented, you can get um, that aged garlic. I'm trying to think of what it's called, but um, you can get kyoli. K Y O L I C. Kyolic gar garlic, it's aged garlic, and that can come, I think, in capsule form. That's quite potent. Uh -huh.
Are these details in your book, self -help? They are. They are in more detail no. with all the references. And um, back to the star. So even getting fruit right down. So the two fruits that we advocate in my book, there's stage one antifungal program and stage two antifungal. So stage one, it's the only fruit is grapefruit and Granny Smith apples because they're very low sugars. And then stage two, you can start introducing some berries because they're also very low, low sweet. But all vegetables are fine, all legumes are fine, but get the carbohydrates down a little bit. So in my next lecture, when we look at the liver, I'll actually be showing in the, the, uh, the carbohydrate equation. The third one is alkalines. So cancer and the fungus, as you'll see when we look at, I think we're looking at cancer tomorrow, I think. But fungus thrives in an acid environment. So it's creating a more alkaline environment. So how you can create a more alkaline environment, all your vegetables are alkaline. All your dark green leafy vegetables, incredibly alkaline. And so um, just just uh, targeting on more vegetables, less fruit. Um, wheat is very acid forming, so going over more to other grains like millet and uh, buckwheat. Legumes, legumes are fantastic. So just as long as they're well soaked and well rinsed, rinse that dirty water away, that is the water that will give you wind. I rinse it well before I cook, I rinse it well halfway through cooking, and halfway through cooking, then I put the, the beans with a lovely rich sauce and let that have the last, last cooking time. Does that get rid of the lectins too? Yes. Oh, yes. Does. You've heard of lectins? Yeah. lectins? Lectins are in all unripe fruit. Now the birds know, don't they? I was in uh, Living Springs in Alabama two weeks ago and the figs are, the figs are ripe and the birds know as soon as they're ripe, the colour changes. In unripe fruit, lectins are high, but in ripe fruit, then the lectins are basically not there. So lectins almost, you can see it, that God put it in there to deter us from eating, you know, because there's that bitterness. And that the grain that's fairly high in lectins is quinoa. And if you notice that if you just cook quinoa, it has a bitterness. But if you rinse and rinse and rinse before you cook it, there's no bitterness. That's because you've rinsed the lectins away. And in his book, um, Plant Paradox, Dr. Stephen Gundry, I wasn't really interested in reading the book but it was given to me just before I went to Australia in 2021 and I was put in quarantine for two weeks, so I had to read it. <laughs> <laughs> My husband said I thought solitary confinement had been outlawed. <laughs> anyway, that's another story. I, I got annoyed with the book because he claims that our taste buds developed over so many billions of years and the lectins, well, I, I don't believe that. But I had to keep going back to the book because I'm in a room all by myself for two weeks. <laughs> and I'm so glad I read it because I see what he's saying, but I come to totally different conclusions. Mm. You see, mm. if you rinse well, so rinse very well and pressure cook or long slow cook your legumes, no lectins. Oh, that's the answer. Hey. Mm. But if you pour a packet of lentils into your soup and eat that, you're going to get a lot of lectins <clears throat> and a lot of wind. <laughs> and if you sourdough your bread, you culture your grains, no lectins. That's why the sourdough way of making bread is a far superior way of making bread. It kills the lectins. There are some fruits that, or vegetables, well, we see them as vegetables, but they're actually fruit, and that's the nightshade group of vegetables. So that's tomato, and uh, you call it bell pepper. We call it capsicum, and uh, eggplant or aubergine, and white potato. 
they are higher in lectins. But traditionally, the Europeans always de-seeded, de-skinned the tomatoes and the bell peppers, and that takes the lectins away. Mm. So if you look at Sally Fallon's book, um, Nourishing Traditions, she looks at all the traditional way that food was cooked and prepared. And you know, when you look at it, it eliminates the lectins. So lectins are in foods, but if they're properly prepared, then the lectins are not there. What are lectins? Why don't we like to know? Lectins are a little chemical that are in certain foods. And they're in unripe fruit, so when the ripe fruit it's gone. So we should be eating ripe fruit. Ideally, ideally buying fruit that is ripe. I never liked pawpaw, you call them papaya. Mm -hmm. Until I moved to Queensland and started eating the pawpaw straight from the trees. Mm. Different fruit altogether. And of course then there's no lectins when you eat it right. And so that's simply the story of the lectins. If the food's properly prepared, then that disarms the lectins. Oats are high, but the Scottish used to soak their oats over the day and slow cook it overnight. No lectins. Hmm. But today, what are people doing? They're cooking them in five minutes. Well, but there'll be lectins. And you'll find a lot of people that eat oats like that, they have bloating. <laughs> Maybe they're falling asleep in the office. And the hybridised wheat of today, very high in lectins, because gluten is a lectin. And in the hybridisation process of hybridising the wheat, it caused a very complex protein or gluten structure. But I, so cherry tomatoes, not a good idea. I mean, I love those. You can't cherry, to cherry tomatoes are fantastic. Just pluck them right. Oh, okay. <laughs> pluck them right off the... What was the name? Fallon what? Fallon, F-A-L-L-E-N. Yeah. Do they modify the wheat in Australia like they did in America? Absolutely, absolutely. It went worldwide. 1950s, it was hybridised in Mexico. And then the late 70s, it went worldwide. Not Dr. Norman Bullock got a Nobel Prize for his hybridised wheat in the 1976. Then it went worldwide. So by the 1990s, worldwide, all breads, all pastas, pretzels, every all hybridised wheat. Unless you can get the original wheat, which is Enkenhorn or Spalt or Kamut or Emma, they're some of the, the original strains of wheat. That's, that's a different, that different situation. So coming back to looking at how you can eliminate fungus from the body, uh, starve the fungus, kill it, and alkalize. Alkalize by having lots of uh, alkaline foods, which is your vegetables, your greens, and also um, a lot of people choose to supplement with something like green barley, barley greens, super greens, so this can be part of the program. What do you do to fungus toenails? People say, I've tried all sorts of things, but you know, fungus toenails are just an illustration that there's a fungal problem in the body. <laughs> So you've got to stop everything that feeds it. And I'll give you a, an essential oil mix that can be put on it. Of course, this must be done. So it's one part oregano, oregano essential oil, and six part coconut. You put oregano essential oil straight onto the toenail, it'll eat out the toenail. Obviously not overnight, but little by little. So it's a little bit strong. Some people might like their toenail eaten out because they don't like the look of it. <laughs> but what you want coming through is a, a clear toenail. So to do that, you've got to hit it from the inside. So I trust I've shown you by this lecture that germs don't cause disease, they're the result. They're the result of unhealthful conditions. So what is a cold? What is a flu? Well, in the 1940s, the Common Cold Research Unit was set up in Salisbury, London, to find the cause and the cure of the, of the common cold. After 40 years, they closed down in disgrace because of a total inability to find the cause and the cure of the common cold, because they never will. It's a house clean. And all that stuff you're blowing out of your nose and coughing up, guess what? Praise God, the house is being cleansed. 
And so when a double vaxxed man came to our health retreat with COVID and gave it to half our staff and half our guests. Oh my goodness. And I had a, um, a migraine for the first day and then a high fever for the next two days, I was so happy. Because you know, fever is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. Fever is a, has a purpose and it, ha it burns out harmful pathogens in the body. And I laid on my bed and just slept. And I said, thank you, Father in heaven, for this wonderful fever. <laughs> People say, what did you do? I said, nothing. <laughs> because I live in a body with an inbuilt ability to heal itself. I drank a lot of water. I slept a lot. I think on the second day at about four o'clock, I had a banana. That was about it. So I ate very little. I gave my body all the conditions for healing. I lay down on nature's operating th table and I allowed my body to cleanse and heal. Next day I was so tired, no wonder. You know, having a fever is like climbing a mountain. <laughs> <laughs> so when people say, I've had a fever and I'm so tired, I said, you will be. So for the first day, if I lay down for 10 minutes, I, I, I could do about 10 minutes. <laughs> Next day, if I lay down for 10 minutes, I could do half an hour. So by, by one week, all was well. And I believe it was because of what I do, not on the odd day, but what I do every day to my body. The body can heal itself. And that house clean, those flus, what they do is they just clean out your house. Let it. And when we're going to clean our house, what do we use? Water. <laughs> Put a lot of water in there. Why didn't I use garlic or anything like that? Oh, I didn't want to do anything. I just want to lay in bed. I had a fever. <laughs> yeah, that may have helped. And so I trust that you now see it's not the germ and it's not the gene. It's actually what we do it to our bodies, the conditions we give our bodies that indicates how we react to such things. We're going to have a break now. And when we come back, we're going to study the liver, which is the body's project manager, and we're going to have a look at detox.